Good morning, church. It's great to see you. This is take two for me, not just because it's week two, but also I pre-recorded this same segment about half an hour ago. I thought it looked really awesome until I realised that, uh, well, the Wallabies rugby top I had on was probably not the best shirt to wear for worship. So I've dressed up for the occasion. I'm really excited. I thought last week went well, but we've made a few changes, a few little tweaks here and there. Martin is doing an amazing job. Uh, and look, if you get a chance, send him an email and thank him. But Because uh, I know next week he's got three services to put together. I know that might sound funny, but next week we have a Maundy Thursday, a Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And stay tuned because I actually think we're going to have a drive-through communion service. And you're probably thinking, well, how do we do that? It's just like Macca's, only it's food for the soul. And if they're allowed to do drive-through, I'm sure we can do drive-through. But I will keep you all posted about that in the days ahead. Well, to make sure that I'm keeping things uh, in the worship scene going really well, I've got my little worship buddy here today, and he uh, he's going to dance along with us as we sing some of the songs and also play his ukulele because that's what he does best. And to make sure that I'm theologically correct, well, I... well... I've got one of the big guys with me, one of the big men of the Christian faith uh, all the way uh, from overseas to just make sure that I'm blessing you the right way, that I'm bringing the word to you the right way. But actually, that's not dependent upon a few little uh, bogwell-headed things here. That's dependent on the Holy Spirit. Last week, we had the great privilege of uh, looking into the scriptures and how the scriptures talk to us about how the Holy Spirit is with us. This week, we're looking at Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday. And as he comes into Jerusalem, then how he heads to the temple and he overturns the tables. Not very nice for some, especially the establishment. But then how he also performs healings and teachings on the people who were there. What type of leader are we looking for today in, uh, in, in a world that is going through some turmoil, in a world that is focused purely on one thing? And it seems to have just brought a lot of other areas of our lives toppling down. But we look for leadership. We look with hope for what tomorrow holds. And I believe as we go through this service today, we will spend some wonderful times hearing words of hope in the songs and reading words of hope in the scriptures and hearing from the gospel message how Jesus is a leader of hope. Let's pray. Our gracious God, as we join here this morning, we're thankful for the beauty and the wonders of life that you bring before us. Yes, it seems that part of our society is crashing down around us, but in the midst of that, you are faithful. You are ever with us. You are ever present, walking every step with us. Calm our hearts, our souls, our minds. Calm our friends and our family. May our focus be on you. May you lift our hearts as we join together in songs of worship this morning and involve ourselves engaged in your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'll see you at the end. Oh, I love to hear the song of creation The wind and the rhythm of the rain Oh, the thunder, it speaks of your power But there's something in the sound of the saints I've been washed in the roar of the ocean Found peace in the echoes of a cave And the trees of the field, they clap their hands but there's something in the sound of the saints From the lips of those you saved A redemption song will rise With a sound so full it cracks the sky Whoa! On the lips of those you saved, 
A redemption song will rise Every tongue, every tribe Hear the church your bride Whoa. We boldly approach you, gracious God, coming with Jesus, whose loving sympathy takes away our shame and makes it possible to come to you fearlessly. You know us thoroughly, the good and the bad in us, what is creative and what is destructive, our strengths and our weaknesses. But we come with Jesus, knowing ourselves as sons and daughters, that we are loved, not for our perfection, but for your love's sake which sees us, knows us, judges and forgives us, and keeps us yours forever. Gracious God, as you have brought us into the richness of faith, keep us always aware that our hope for the future exists only in the continuing tragedy and triumph of your love, as we see it in Christ Jesus our Lord. And gracious God, we're thankful for Jesus as he came into Jerusalem how he laid down his life for each one of us and rose again triumphant three days later. His final words, it is finished, was actually the start of something new for each one of us. And ever since his resurrection, we hear those precious words uttered into our lives this morning and every other morning, your sins are forgiven. And we say, thanks be to God. Amen.
on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath the debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many His mercy is more And praise the The peace of the Lord be with you. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. The, the peace, peace of, of the, the Lord, Lord be, be with you all. all. Hello everyone. We're going to try a simple little experiment. Nothing to worry about. We can all manage to do it. I want you to think of someone in our church family that you'd usually see each week. Imagine they are there with you right now and repeat these words after me. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Now, I'd just like to give you a little reminder that Reverend Nick has asked me to remind you all to please email, phone or text him with any specific prayer requests you may have. Thank you. And now I'd like you to join me in prayer. I'm going to start with a Bible reference to assist us through these troubled times. It comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you at this time, physically apart from one another, but united by your Holy Spirit. We bow our heads with thanks for your unfailing love, blessings and goodness for each and every one of us. We thank you for your faithfulness to guide and watch over us in these times of uncertainty, for lifting us with your scripture in the Bible that comforts us and reminds us of your promises, provision and protection. You, O oh Lord, know that we are tempted to worry about our world at present. Our hearts are filled with fear, weakness, confusion, and some may be overcome by feelings of helplessness. We need the strength and peace that only you can give. Help us, Lord God, to steady and calm our racing thoughts and remember that you and you alone are in control. Remind us of that very simple truth that we find our rest in you. We especially think of those the world over who have lost loved ones to this coronavirus already, Lord, and those who have a family member, friend or work colleague in hospital as the amazing medical teams work continuously 
to minister to all those who are critically ill. Grant them your comfort and peace, which passes all understanding, and surround them with your loving arms at this distressing and very sad time. I include here a quotation from Max Licato. If anyone knows and understands the pain that comes from losing someone you love, God does. In addition to everyone adapting to the new normal to stop the spread of the virus, we have heard disturbing reports of people treating their fellow human beings in most unhelpful, hurtful and inconsiderate ways. Lord, with your grace and mercy, send your Holy Spirit to make these unkind souls reflect and become aware of what Jesus taught us in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 12. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. Help us all to remember the story in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples in the middle of the storm. Jesus was able to calm the winds and the currents in the water. So why not the winds and currents of this disease to get us safely to where we need to be? Similarly, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus assured believers that worry was futile. God cares for the smallest bird on earth. So there's no need for any of us to be anxious or dismayed because his father and our father cares deeply about us and knows what is best and when it is best to answer our prayers. Some say the sky is darkest just before the dawn. Lord, we need your light in every sense of the word to restore our world to good health and to give hope to all those who are now unemployed and have no income to support them and their families. Grant those in authority on earth to think and act with wisdom, to make careful and considered decisions to help those in financial hardship, including those who have no home. We pray for those within our church community whose regular activities have been curtailed by this pandemic, not being able to see and spend time with family members, grandchildren, friends, and those we usually see in groups and clubs we belong to. Help us, Lord, to remember that we still belong to you. We are your children, each one of us valued and precious in your sight and that we are part of your worldwide church family. Remind us that the load of stress that may be shackling us will fall away when we rest our minds, trusting the one who conquered death and rose again. Because our Lord Jesus Christ did exactly that, conquered death and rose again, he can and will surely conquer an earthly sickness. Enable each one of us to keep our eyes fixed and focused on our wonderful Saviour and the ultimate sacrifice he paid for each one of our sinners as we approach this blessed Easter time. Lord God, you are our hope now, in this moment and forever. And we put our trust in you to help us make choices during this coming week that will honour you in every way every single day to direct our words, deeds, thoughts and actions to give all glory to your name. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea In the
the silence you won't let go In the questions your truth will hold Your great love will lead me through You are the peace in my troubled sea Whoa, You are the peace in my troubled sea My lighthouse, my to show Today's reading comes from the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 21. It's verses 1 to 17. And in this reading, there are two parts to the story. Reading from verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks, cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, 
while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The second part of the reading is titled, Jesus at the Temple. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? they asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you ever read from the lips of children and infants you Lord, have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. This is the word of the Lord. Here we are on Palm Sunday, a most wonderful time in the church's history. Uh, the, the, it's the beginning of Holy Week. It's the time when we as a church reflect of the coming of Christ into Jerusalem, just as our passage was talking about today, and some of the different aspects of Jesus and how he engaged people as he goes through this Holy Week experience. I'm glad that we're all able to be here um, sharing this online and uh I know it's different to me being out the front of the church. Uh, one person's bit of feedback was uh, it was easier to follow you because you weren't walking all over the front area of the church as you preached this week. 
So that's good. And some people have found the little notes that we put up as the sermon goes along quite helpful. Others, however, have said, oh, Nick, please, can you just video yourself? Well, we might get into doing that next week or the week after. But just for now, we're going to use this this medium as, as how the sermon is given. My question this week is, what type of leadership do you want? As we've looked over the last couple of weeks, there's, there's been some wonderful aspects of leadership as we've seen it. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. So we were talking about God being our shepherd of our lives. And then last week in Romans 8, we were talking about how the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, leads us in the life that we're living. Well, this week, we're actually going to look at Jesus and how he leads and how he leads in while he's in this walk towards Jerusalem and the walk towards the cross. You know, we're all very judgmental about how people lead in our society. Uh, anyone who's had a boss that they didn't like or a boss that they did like can tell you the reasons why or why not that they like those bosses. Uh, sometimes you can tell us about how different people leading things in the church or community groups, why you think they're good leaders or not. And it seems sometimes that some people have a natural disposition to be a leader while others are comfortable not being that person. Well, this week, uh, today, as we look at the last steps of Jesus' leadership before the cross or the last steps of them, he his engagement with his people is quite amazing as he walks into Jerusalem or rides into Jerusalem and then his engagement at the temple. Both of these speak richly of his leadership qualities and strengths. It's easy to miss some of the great things about his leadership. As we just look at the stark differences in these two stories, it's it's almost like why are these two stories side by side? But there is a good reason behind it. And I think in the in the way in which it plays in the lead up to Holy Week or in the start of Holy Week, it causes us to stop and see the difference in how people can easily be swayed very quickly, but how people are a people of hope, always looking for a leader who is ethical and brings hope. I, I, I do like, however, just this one little bit at the beginning of this where uh, Jesus says, go into the village ahead of you to two of his disciples. And at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt and, and untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks anything of you, say the Lord needs them and he'll send them right away. Uh, I think it's quite funny that it, this is here, but it's actually to fulfill a prophecy from the Old Testament. But. Uh, that aside, could you imagine if the disciples just going towards this village are sitting there and as they're walking along, they're, they're saying to each other, so what do we actually do if they call someone and they get really cranky about this donkey? Well, see, I actually think that maybe the disciples had enough faith and knowledge of how things worked with Jesus by this time that they sat there and went, well, sure, if anyone's going to actually ask the question, it's all covered. It's all good because... Jesus knows how things are going to continue to play out. And so, no doubt, if someone had actually questioned them, ultimately they probably would have shrugged their shoulders and said, well, hey, that's fine, off you go, give it to the Lord, let him use my donkeys. So we get to this triumphant entry. It's, it's interesting because there's a little bit of a parallel here between when the Maccabean uprising had taken place many years beforehand and how they'd had a victory and how they laid down palm leaves and came into Jerusalem and how they cried out Hosanna, Hosanna to those as they led a triumphal entry back into Jerusalem. But this is a different season. This is a challenging time. It's a time of political turmoil and upheaval. They're under oppression of the Romans. There are zealots. Remember, there's one of those who's actually one of Jesus' disciples. And we know that Simon actually had a, had a sword on him because he cuts off the, the, the servants here in the garden. And so this is a, a trying time for many people. And others are causing uprising and others are causing issues. And the Romans just want a peaceful time. They also know it's Passover, so there's more people here than ever before. And entering into Jerusalem is going to be a challenge. However, as Jesus arrives, the people are singing his praises, celebrating the works of his hands, talking about his miracles and teachings. Hosanna, Hosanna, they cry out as the king comes riding into Jerusalem, for they feel that freedom is nigh. But do they fully understand the leader that is on this donkey? Is this leader the leader that they're really expecting? I mean, maybe they are expecting this physical uprising, this, this violent uprising where the Romans are kicked out because, let's face it, 
we, we always look at how our physical world could be better. And for them, the oppression of the Romans being taken away would make their world better and they could go back to doing all the things that they normally do nice and peacefully. A little bit like what's going on in our society today with this coronavirus. It seems that our whole world's been turned on its head by the coming of a virus into the world. And that now we are all being we're bunkering down in our houses. We can't worship together. In fact, there's, there's limitations on what we're able to do. And it's a challenge for us. And we all sit with hope that soon this will end. But for us, our hope is that, well, the virus will disappear. But for, and for these people, it was that Rome would disappear. But ultimately, Jesus' hope is placed in salvation and reconnection of the world to God the Father and his family. So here's Jesus, and many are calling him the next great prophet. Maybe he is Isaiah or Elisha. Maybe he's Moses. His teaching has stirred the hearts of men and women, and it still does today. Amen. It still does today. Everyone's interested in this procession from those who celebrate. Maybe those who are onlookers looking from afar who've never really met this Jesus. Maybe it's the Romans and, and the guards who are standing around, looking down, making sure that there's no uprising. And then there's the priests and all from the temple. Little did they know that this was the week that was going to change the world. You know, everyone, everyone likes to back a winner. And so as these people are celebrating, I think they think Jesus is the winner that they love. And, and here we are, we're heading into this year of the Olympics, which has now been postponed because of that little virus. But I remember many years ago watching Ben Johnson win the 100 metres. Uh, he and Carl Lewis used to have this, this tussle over who could run fastest in the 100 metres. And, and especially in the Olympics, it was, it's, that, uh, it's that really top fast race that we all love. Uh, and, and I remember as it happened and they went under 10 seconds, I was thinking, wow, that is just extraordinary. Yet two years later, he was decried for drug use. And then we come across Lance Armstrong, the, the man who won more Tour de France's than anyone else. And then we find out a number of years later that he too was a drug user. He'd used performance enhancing drugs to help him win. Remember Alan Bond, the man who helped us win the America's Cup, the man who, who transformed much of the way business was done out of WA and even across Australia. And then a number of years later, he's locked up for fraud. You know, as long as the winner stays a clean skin, we love them. As long as they do what we believe is ethical in our sight, we love them. But if they do something wrong, then we shun them. Well, Jesus heads to the temple. And I've got to say, if we were gathered in our church this morning and a minister from another denomination or another church walked into our church, walked in up the front, up to the altar and threw it over, turned everything over, knocked over the flowers confronted you all with it, you'd think this person had either lost their marbles or there's something strangely different about them. I think some of us would actually be quite distressed and angry. We'd be very annoyed because you don't upset God's holy temple like this. Well, it could be argued that Jesus did his cause no favours by heading into the temple and turning the tables over. And let's not forget, in some of the other gospel events, he makes a whip and drives people out of the temple, calling them income merchants and people who are trying to sell God. Yeah, this is a very confronting story. From the story of him being celebrated and praised coming into the city, to heading into a temple, and now all of a sudden he is driving people out. Well, Jesus came with a purpose and a passion. He came to redeem a world. He came ready to confront all the man-made rules and regulations that prevented us all from connecting with God. Imagine not having enough money for a dove so you were kept in a state of noted shame as your sin could not be atoned. Well, that was the kind of stuff that was taking place. So you had to buy your animal. You had to buy your forgiveness of sin. The temple actually started to choose who was in or out. Who was good or bad? Who was honoured and who was shamed? Who was good enough in God's sight? Well, I just want to encourage you again. It is not my role. It is not your role 
to ever decide who is in and who out, who is out of heaven. It's not any of our roles to work out who is connected to God and who is not connected to God. It is our uh, our job to help point people to Jesus and what Jesus has done for each one of us to bring salvation. And so let me encourage you as we head into this week, this is the week that changes the world from having to buy your offerings to having all of your sins paid for by Christ. I wonder if those who cried Hosanna as Jesus came in were also present in the temple but were now remaining silent as he overturned those tables. We sometimes miss that Jesus shows a righteous anger for justice. This is not an uncontrolled anger for revenge. It's a justice anger. And see, justice is at the heart of Jesus' mission and purpose. It's at the heart of God's plan to reconnect. It's at the heart of who we are as God's people. But there's two pauses I want to draw us to in these stories. In fact, one of the pauses actually comes from Luke's, uh, Luke's uh, kind of recollection of this event of Jesus coming in. And as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, Luke writes this in, in Luke 19, verse 41. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. See, in the midst of this event, he stops and cries. Why? Because he loves his people all his people, and he is mourning over how they've been deceived by the Jewish leaders as to how they could be in a relationship with their father in heaven. He really is very sad about this. He's sad that they've gotten it so wrong, and yet they think in their own minds that they've gotten it so very right. It's a beautiful thing when a leader has that much love for his people. But then again, Jesus pauses again. See, at the end of this story in the temple courts, we see Jesus stopping to show yet again God's mercy, forgiveness and grace by healing the blind and the lame and the sick in the temple courts. Right there in the temple courts, in front of the priests, after he's overturned everything. He then walks over to those who were sitting there hoping with all hope and praying with all of their might that God would touch their lives and heal and forgive them. And Jesus walks over and gives them a taste of heaven. And that's exactly what takes place. The children cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. And the priests couldn't cope with that. All they have been waiting for, all the prophecies being fulfilled, the Messiah was standing there right in their courts, but they were spiritually blind to see him. A true leader loves and cares for his people. And Jesus' example here is one of love, compassion, forgiveness, mercy and grace. He just wants to be connected and his people to be free of the shackles that are binding them. He knows the end of the world's brokenness is close. And so he continues to give people a taste of glory. However, it is the priests and the principal men of the temple who miss it when they should have been the ones who most understood it. Jesus stood there in the face of arrogance. And when he overturned the temples and drove the money changers out, Jesus was standing up for justice. He would not let them think that their paradigm was correct. Rather, he broke it down before their eyes in their very midst so that there was no mistaking it, that when the risen Christ came back, the church would know that God was never for sale ever again. So often today we cry for justice and God and often God calls us and calls on us as the church to step forward and to be the people of hope that society desperately desires. Does not society need Jesus today? Do they not need Jesus to come into their lives and, and, and into their worlds and turn it in on its head? Do they not need their religion broken down for the sake of their spiritual lives being restored? Ah, I think that some people are more caught up on their religion than what they are on being connected to God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John three seventeen. so powerful, not to condemn, but to save. And to save it because of Jesus, not through you or through anyone else's works, just through Jesus. I, I, I loved reading uh, many years ago of some of the different traditions churches have. Now, you might know I'm not very big on, on some of the liturgical traditions that some churches have. 
But there's an Easter Saturday tradition in one of the churches in the Northern Hemisphere. And they have their big spring clean on Easter Saturday. So Good Friday, they have their service and everyone goes home. On Easter Saturday, everyone comes in and everything is removed from the church. It's cleaned and new flowers and the like are returned for Easter morning service. And here is a great example of an Easter cleaning of a church. But guess what? Let's not leave it there for a building. How about we think about how God can do an Easter cleaning of our lives on Easter Saturday as well? As we remember the terrible death of Jesus, yet the liberating death of Jesus and his words, it is finished and our restoration to new life that comes through the cross. Well, society has changed. And here we are in the midst of a tragedy and a challenge for our society again at this time. It's been many, many years since society has been challenged by such uh, a tragedy. And everything seems to be overturned and our normal way of life has been shut down. So why are we so confronted? Is it because our normal ways of seeking pleasure are no longer accessible? Is it because we're forced into a way of life that limits our freedoms as we see it? I think that's probably a lot of it, isn't it? We're confronted. Our normal ways of life, the, our physical way of life, and how we like to do lives for ourselves is not being able to be done that way anymore. We can't work from our offices or we can't go out and, and just go to a coffee shop with friends. We can't connect the way we've always connected. It's really very disquieting. But there's a reset button that might be being hit at this time. And, and in doing so, our society seems to be progressing backwards because it seems the government is taking away our liberty and our freedom. I mean, for three people to meet together means that we could be fined. It's changing our social interactions. We, we can't just go and hug and we can't just go and shake hands. It's bringing about a newfound chaos in a world that we love and we have to have control over. Ah, a world that we love to have control over. I think that's really what the problem is. As long as we can control it, then it all seems to be going well. And maybe for the religious leaders in the time of Jesus, they were controlling the temple really well. Maybe over the generations, we've been controlling things really well. But God doesn't call us to control things really well. He actually calls on us to yield to his control. And so in these times when there is this disquiet and we lose our control, we cry out to God and we say, what is happening? And his reply, well, why are the things of this earthly world and its pleasures more desirable and satisfying than me? I mean, come on, as Christians, if we yield to God, then we look for the pleasures and the desires of God not just for the physical pleasures and desires of this world. It sounds almost too simple, but it's not. Because we're constantly in a tension between our physical selves and that which is ruled by death, as we spoke about last week, and that of this Holy Spirit and his leading forward for each one of us. But God is a God of hope. We really do not know how far we have strayed from God and his paths sometimes until we look behind at where we've been. And that's what's happening for us all. The good news is that God has promised us that he is with us and he will be with us to the very end of the ages, in all seasons, both good and bad, and that his Holy Spirit will sustain us. And that, my friends, is this wonderful hope that even though we might be straying from his paths, he actually moves off that path with us and stays with us, holding us and guarding us and sustaining and nurturing us in hope that we will step back onto it. These tough days may be a catalyst for our lives to see renewal of a relationship with God. God is so good that even if we've walked away, slipped away, fallen away, turned away, headed away, he has made a new way for us which starts with forgiveness, mercy and grace and finishes with hope. He has made a new way for us through Christ Jesus. So back to our story. So just as Jesus cried over Jerusalem and turned over the tables to bring about renewal, today he still does the same for us all. He still cries out for those who are lost, broken, hurt, wounded or disconnected 
and he won't stop crying out for you. He won't stop crying out for those he loves, and he loves everyone. And he will also show great leadership as he enters into our lives and turns over the false altars and the, and the like that we've built up. Why? So that we can have a better relationship with him again. Sometimes I don't think we like it when he comes into our lives and overturns the tables in our lives. It's kind of disquieting and it's upsetting. It's uncomfortable. But you know what? At the end of the day, it helps us put our faith in God and our trust in God. And it helps us know that it's not about what we're doing, because so often it is about, we think it's about that. But it's actually about what's being done by Christ Jesus. So this is Holy Week. This is the week that confronts us. It challenges us. It uplifts us. It absolves us, it empowers us, it rebirths us, and it forgives us, and it restores every one of our lives. Are we the people crying, Jesus, you are inconvenient? Or are we the people who cry, you gave me life? You gave me life. Not just any old life, not a worn and torn life, but the best life. And you know what, brothers and sisters, all we need to do is yield to receive it. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we head into this wonderful Holy Week, there are many of us who've strayed from paths, as many of us who've turned our faces to other gods and to other ways of doing things. There's been some of us who've just walked away from you altogether and we're feeling a bit distant. But we ask that you would draw us close to you, that we would constantly feel your presence that we would feel the warmth of your embrace, your forgiveness, your mercy, your love pouring out into each one of our lives. And that we would hear those precious words that our sins are forgiven, our sicknesses are healed, and our shame is taken away. Gracious God, we're thankful for all that you give us. Amen. you father great is your love day after day I see who was and is and who is to come is watching over me you write my story
I hope you've enjoyed that service. You know, change is always good, isn't it? So during that service, did you notice anything change? There's an email question for you. If you've noticed something that's changed during the service, well, maybe you can email it to me. That could be a bit of a mystery quiz for the week. But more than that, I pray that this week you will have an awesome time, that you'll connect up with family and friends, and you know what, in different ways to what you used to. Maybe this is the time when email and phone calls and Skyping and even some of those other methods that are out there help us to connect in a really beautiful and deep way. Hey, there's something I'd love for you to do. If you're any good with technology, and you, you don't need to be a genius, I mean, have a look at me. Um, what I'd like you to do is do a video snippet of you passing the piece. All you need to do, and if you've got a computer with a camera in it, you just have to say, with it on record, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Make sure you smile so we've got your happy face. And then what I want you to do is email it to me or to Martin. If you don't have those addresses, you can find an email address on our website. And what we'll do is when we do the passing of the peace each uh, service, we'll be able to put a couple of different people up each time. Now, maybe you're not part of our church and you think, oh, can I do that? Sure, you can. I've asked some people, some of our old couples who've now moved to Broken uh, Hill and others who are up in Queensland and other places. I've said, send down a passing of the peace. We'd love to have you. If you're in our e-community, join, join us up. We'd love to see you on, uh, on the passing of the peace. But this week, what a big week. It's going to be great. It's, uh, it's Easter week. Uh, and, you know, we don't get to do everything we'd like to do this week. One thing I'd like to just point out is normally this is a week where we have communion a, a couple of times and um, the cup will be filled, but it won't be shared. Not the way we normally will. We're looking at a way of doing uh, communion where I bring it around to you at your houses uh, and we'll do it. It'll be drive by communion with the roaming rev and I'll come around in the car. You'll have to bring your own cup out the front, but I'll have the bread with me and I'll have it packaged up for you. And I'll also probably be wearing gloves and I'll probably also have a mask on. It's not because I don't love to see your beautiful face or I need to hide mine. It's probably a small mercy for a few of you. But it's so that you can have communion. You can go back inside and uh, just share it and enjoy it. So that's something that's coming up. Maundy Thursday, we will have a service. It'll be uh, downloadable as well, as will Good Friday. Good Friday, sadly. Sadly, I say, we don't get to do the wonderful thing of standing out on the corner of Amaru and the highway, hoisting high the cross with the flowers on it and the streamers and the ribbons for all to see. But I'm hoping there's another way of doing that, which will get it up and we'll have it looking absolutely great on that corner because people look to that for hope. And that's something which this week is about. It's a week of hope. In the midst of all the terrible numbers that are going up on your TV screens and in the newspapers saying how many people have the coronavirus or how many people are now dying, in the midst of that, we need hope. Jesus came for more than just our physical well-being. He came for our spiritual well-being. And as he utters the words, it is finished on Good Friday, he rose to a newness of life for each one of our souls, for each one of our spiritual beings, so that on Easter Day we celebrate not only the reconnection of us with God, but life eternal. These are tough times, really tough times. But in these tough times, may the word of God feed you, nurture you and care for you. May you have a blessed week. In the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.